It's also worth noting that Stalin initially held to all of his agreements, um, especially with the British. Two big things should be kept in mind. Um, Berlin was supposed to be split into four districts. One Soviet, one British, one American, and one French. It was the Americans, with their allied support, who unified all of those into a single administrative district under the Americans. It was the allies with NATO who formed, who formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization first. The Warsaw Pact was formed in reaction to NATO. And also, Stalin, right, again, trying to protect the gains made uh, under, right, the bloody fighting of World War II, promised the British that he would not give aid to the Communist Party of Greece. And he held good to that. And the Communist Party of Greece rose up against the fascistic monarchist government and received no aid. Because again, he made an agreement to protect the rest of the Soviet Union, and in doing so, did not support right, this other communist movement. And so, right, this continues. Uh, the Soviet Union becomes an arsenal for socialism. They continue to fund countries where they can. But again, it seems absolutely clear, right, that the defense of the Soviet Union is worth more than risky expeditions on untested parties. And one should keep this in mind when viewing Stalinism as simply cynical opportunism at a power grab. Instead, it's a recognition that real existing Soviet, or er, real existing socialism is worth defending and sacrificing things for even if it appears, no, even if it is morally repugnant. So, just, I, I mean, this sort of leads us theoretically to what is known as socialism in one country, right? Um, Stalin believed that socialism could be built in one country. This is absolutely true. But of course, what's the alternative? If socialism can't be built in one country, it has to be built internationally. What was the Soviet Union to do? Was it supposed to join socialist Germany and socialist France and socialist England and the socialist United States in a united socialist front? No. It was a single besieged country that went from being a backwards of Europe to one of two superpowers. And of course, here's what Stalin specifically has to say about that. The overthrow of the power of the bourgeois and the establishment of the power of the proletariat in one country does not yet mean the complete victory of socialism has been ensured. After consolidating its power and leading the peasantry in its wake, the proletariat of the victorious country can and must build a socialist society. But does this mean that it will thereby achieve a complete and final victory of socialism? I.e., does that mean that the forces of only one country it can finally consolidate socialism and fully guarantee the country against intervention and consequently also uh, against restoration? No, it does not. For this victory of the revolution in at least several countries is needed. Therefore, the development and support of the revolution in other countries is an essential task of the victorious revolution. Therefore, the revolution which has been victorious in one country must regard itself not as a self-sufficient entity but as an aid, as a means for hastening the victory of the proletariat in other countries. And then uh, finally, right, in his own words, this is what Stalin sees as Marxist-Leninism. And this is what people characterize as Stalinism. Uh, speaking of revolution and victory, what is needed to attain this? To attain this, it is necessary to carry out at least three main tasks that confront the dictatorship of the proletariat, quote, on the morrow of victory. A, to break the resistance of the landlord and capitalists who have overthrown and expropriated, uh, who have been overthrown and expropriated by the revolution, to liquidate every attempt on their part to restore the power of capital, and to liquidate every attempt on their part to restore the power of capital. B, to organize the construction in such a way to rally all the working people around the proletariat, 
and to carry on this work through the lines of preparing for the elimination or abolition of classes, i.e. communism, and C, to arm the revolution, to organize the army of the revolution for the struggle against foreign enemies, for the struggle against imperialism. And as a final thought, I believe it was Adorno who was in a written conversation with Mar uh, Martin Heidegger, right, who was a famous Nazi professor uh, of psych uh, philosophy, right, and Marcuse being a communist. And, uh, or, sorry, Adorno. And uh, Heidegger writes Adorno and says, well, all you have to do is look at collectivization. Look at the elimination of the kulaks. Look at the forced deportation of Eastern Germany. That is by far more brutal than anything the Nazis ever did. More people died in those actions than ever died in a concentration camp or in Nazi aggression. And Adorno writes back, the difference between collectivization and the forced deportation of the Soviet Union is the thin difference between civilization and barbarism. And so, again, uh, I wish that I could give a lecture on Stalinism, but there is no such thing. There is only Marxist-Leninism and the recognition of the exigencies of revolution. Thank you very much.